Welcome to One Mind Brainwaves. I'm Solomon Thomas. Throughout the pandemic, we've seen a spike in violent crime across the board in the United States, but perhaps most no noticeably in form of hate crimes against minority communities. Attacks on Asian Americans have been on the rise, anti-Jewish and anti-Muslim incidents have increased with events overseas. All of this with the backdrop of ongoing strugg struggles for racial justice among communities of color. So how does all this trauma affect mental health and diverse typically underserved communities? And how does the perception of stigma impact whether or not people seek help? Today, we'll hear perspectives from two amazing experts. Later, our team at One, One Mind Cyber Guide will tell us about an app that might help you habify your life. But first, let me bring in our guest. Joining me now about mental health and perspectives on stigma in underserved communities, we have Dr. Kofwi Jaraza. He's an associate professor of, psych of, of psychiatry and behavioral sci sciences at Duke University School of Medicine. He is also a 2013 One Mind Rising Star awardee. We also have Dr. Jenny Wang. She's a clinical psychologist and founder of the Asians for Mental Health Community. Kof and Jenny, welcome to Brainwaves. Thank you so much for having us. Thanks for having us. Thank you both so much for being on. You know, we truly appreciate your knowledge, your insight, and all your work you do in the mental health community. It is so important and needed, and um, you're changing and saving lives every day. Um, so, Kof, we're going we're to start with you. You're a neuroscientist whose primar, prim, primary work focuses on the use of technologies to treat mental illness. How did you first become interested in diversity and equity issues surrounding mental health? Yeah, the, the, the question around diversity and inclusion and equity is one that's, that's, that's dear to me. I have family members with persistent and severe mental illness, whether it's depression or schizophrenia or bipolar disorder. And so in my research lab, we work to come up with new treatments and cures for these devastating disorders. And I'm of the belief that intellect is universally distributed. That means that the best way that you build the best team to work on curing these illnesses is to figure out how to get talent from all parts of the population. So if you look across any industry, any team, if it isn't represented by race, gender, ethnicity, you can't convince me that you don't have, that you have the best team work on the talent. So for me, these questions are central to the work that I do. Amazing, and thank you so much for your work um, and the, that you do in the community. Um, I had a sister who had depression and anxiety, and she died by suicide in 2018, and that's why I'm so involved with the cause. So um, I really appreciate your work, and I love your answer about diversity and talent on the board because you need, you need that, um, that empathy, you need that perspective so everyone can have you know, a side of like what each community goes through so we can really attack this and, and find ways to get these underserved communities um, you know, getting the talent and, and, and the work that they need in mental health. Um, so thank you, Goff. And uh, Dr. Jenny, um, you speak frequently, frequently about the intersection of Asian American identity and mental health. What are some of the impacts of race-based discrimination and violence on mental well-being? I think that when we think about race-based discrimination and violence, you know, one of the things is that when you are experiencing that in your environment in a lot of different settings, it creates a sense of lack of psychological safety, right? And so I think one of those things is that, you know, in spaces in which we are constantly on, in hypervigilant mode, where we are constantly checking in with ourselves to see, am I presenting in ways that are um, favorable? Am I presenting in ways that people are accepting of, that creates a lot of tension within a person that they have to manage ongoing throughout their day. So when we think about kind of the effect of racism on people's well-being, there's a lot of psychological energy being spent on managing the dissonance of the outside world in comparison to how you want to show up in that world. Right. And so we often see, you know, higher rates of depression, anxiety. Right. Um, and, you know, it really then trickles down into how does that person feel safe enough to self-advocate, to be able to contribute to value generation in the workplace? It's not just that 
as people of color, we are fearful, but it's also that we may be less willing to be assertive or feel less empowered to show up, right, in more assertive ways in our environment. So I think it's multiple levels of people feeling unsafe. And so the psychological effects of that, but it's also disempowering and also keeps people from being authentic. Definitely. Um, you know, I definitely feel like as like, you know, a minority, we always feel like we have to prove ourselves or have we, our value is not there because we're looked down upon just because we look different or are different. And, um, and just, I remember like growing up, I wouldn't, like I, I was I, biracial. My mom's why my dad's black. I grew up in a predominantly white high school, middle school, elementary school, and like people, this subtle racism and everything. And I couldn't speak up because I was one of two black kids in my grade, and it was just, and it just like gave me anxiety, and it just pushed down my value, my meaning, how I looked at myself. And so I really, really do appreciate the work you're doing. It, it really is needed and, and so important. Um, <clears throat> so, Coffer, going back to you. Um, how prevalent is race-based traumatic stress within minority communities? Yeah, it, it, to, to answer that question, I'll take a bit of a step back. And mm-hmm. I, I like to talk about both our experience as human beings, but also uh, and add some scientific perspective to it. So I think of the, the job of the brain is to help us as organisms, as human beings, survive within an environment. And the brain is built uh, to tell us when the likelihood of that survival is lower because of threats in the environment. And so one of the the, the major challenges that come along with race-based stress is that you're getting messages from the environment that suggest that you don't belong. And you can can certainly... um, think about what we've seen in the last year, even dealing uh, first uh, with COVID and then with uh, looking on TV and seeing there are kind of messages uh, that we're seeing from black and brown folks more likely to die of COVID and uh, us, how we think about those who work on the front line. And then the intersection with seeing um, folks murdered on TV and, and from whether it's from police officers or other types of violence as well. And so these are constant cues that not only us as adults that have have language and narrative to know how to think about this, but that our young people in this country are experiencing these constant cues from their, this, their environment that say they're, that we aren't safe. And so it's hard for me to even gauge the prevalence when I think about how profound uh, the messages have been, especially over the last year and a half um, across our entire society. Dr. Jenny, um, what are you hearing from your patients in the AAPI community about what they're experiencing right now? I think that for the last year and a half, the Asian American community has really kind of had to move through different stages of realization. You know, I think there's this sense that, you know, maybe up until prior to this pandemic point, the status of Asian Americans has been people have said things like, you are next in line to be white, you are the model minority, all of these different stereotypes that have put Asian Americans in this really precarious situation, right, where we have been pitted against other kind of racial groups. And so I think that with the pandemic and with the rhetoric that was used around the pandemic discussions, it really placed Asian Americans in a sense of, you know what, our safety, our belonging, our acceptance has never been guaranteed. In fact, it's always been a very conditional structure that has been kind of dialed up or back based on the social political usefulness of our status, right? And so I think that on the one hand, a lot of my clients are saying, I'm glad that there's more awareness, right? That racism exists within our community um, and that this is happening. On the other side, it places our community in a level of visibility that I don't believe we're really used to. And so that sense of visibility and kind of putting ourselves in that place is also very traumatic as well, right? And so I think that our community in some ways is trying to grapple with what does it mean to realize that these structures have been in place against us all along? And how do we actually harness this current time in which we are being attacked, we feel angry, we feel heartbroken, we feel, you know, distraught, 
how do we now move towards a place of committed action towards social justice, right? And as Asian Americans, we have models of what that has looked like in history with Asian American activists, but as a community, I think we are having to redefine what activism looks like in the Asian American community for ourselves. And that's also very new. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, d- definitely. I, I was, uh, when everything was going on and I reached out to one of my um, Asian American classmates from Stanford and he was just telling me, he was like, you know, I'm so afraid for my parents right now. Like, I feel like they can't even go outside. Like, and like, I was just like, man, like that, the, just the anxiety that creates, like, and the, the trauma that creates, like, it's like you can't walk around being safe. Like, I mean, I feel like sometimes driving, I feel like, you know, if a cop car comes behind me, I just, I put both hands in the wheel. I start like having like a mini panic attack. Like, I'm like, I don't know what could happen. Like, and even though if I'm not being pulled over, it's still just scary. I'm, you know, and then, and, and yeah. So no, I, re- I really appreciate, appreciate that answer. That was amazing. Thank you, Jenny. Um, so this next question is for both of you. Um, you know, we'll have cough go first, but for cough and Jenny, how big of a factor is the stigma in preventing those in underserved communities from seeking mental health resources care that they need? For me, I, I was thinking about uh, the, the trial for George Floyd's murder. And, you know, I think for a lot of us, it was the first time we realized that there was a nine-year-old standing there watching, right? And when you think about trauma um, and worrying about one's brothers or sisters or parents, and the scale and the scope of the racial trauma that people have been um, experiencing the last year, I think about the nine-year-old. Um, and I think about the trauma that she will continue to carry um, for a large part of her life and the, the, the resources that will be necessary to achieve that. I think there's an incredible amount of stigma that goes on and that prevents communities from seeking help because the trauma can be so pervasive, right? And so I, I think the trauma could be so pervasive that there's no ex- expectation that life should exist without that level of trauma. Um, and, then, and then certainly uh, there's also the expectation that, um, you know, we just need to tough it up and push through that because historically that's how uh, trauma of marginalized groups has been treated in this country, particularly those of African descent. Um, the, the trauma has been met with just keep going. It doesn't matter if you're sad or how you feel about it. And, and so I think it's, it's really important to highlight that that, that level of emotional um, wrestling and that emo- level of emotional turmoil is a normal process um, when your experience and the environment is telling you that you don't belong and that there is help available um, to, to navigate that feeling. Um, and I, I think it's our jobs, whether we're physicians or advocates or community members or family members to continue to communicate the message that there is help and assistance available to push through that emotional boundary. Yeah, I would, I would agree that I think the stigma is so high, especially within people of color. And I sometimes think, especially in the Asian American community, it's that we are never really educated about mental health emotional regulation. These are not words that we even grew up with, right? I think about my own immigrant parents and the idea that they would understand the word emotion regulation. They would just look at me as if I I was speaking a different language altogether, right? And so I think that the lack of kind of awareness and knowledge has been a barrier and created some of that stigma because it's kind of I've heard from some people say, well, mental health is a white person thing. It's not really something that our community goes into, right? And so I think that reinforces the sense that that's not something that we can benefit from or that our ancestors, our you know, parents have gone through so much more suffering and they somehow push through. Why can't you? Right. And so I I think that stigma piece really holds people in these kind of unspoken rules of how do you show up when you are struggling? How do you show up when you are needing help? And it keeps people trapped. Right. And that's why I think it's so important for, you know, people of color to come out and say, I'm taking medication for my depression and I'm getting therapy, you know, because I'm really struggling during this life transition. This is how people can look at somebody who they feel represents them and say, actually, that's possible. Mm -hmm. Right. And perhaps I'm going to search for more help or support. Mm -hmm. Truly, truly. I'll also add that I think um, ambassadors are critically important. You know, we can all acknowledge that 
the mental health system in the past has actually failed communities of color. And so it's really important to have ambassadors. Um, it's, it's, it's an honor and a privilege to be here with you two who are remarkable ambassadors who can say to people that there is help in this mental health arena and that there are those who can um, basically improve our emotional experiences on a day-to-day basis. So thank you. Thank you too again um, for, for asking me to be here and uh, for allowing me to join you. <laughs> No, it's, it's truly an honor. And, and both y'all's answers were unbelievable and, and so important. Like, I think I wish everyone could hear this because it's so true. The stigma is so big uh, against mental health, especially in those of minority communities. Um, and Jenny, I love what you hit on. Like, we're not taught the language to talk about these these subjects, like depression, anxiety. Like, I went through high school with a sister who was diagnosed with depression, anxiety, and I didn't know what they meant. I knew that they were something, but what were they? And my whole life, I really didn't know what mental health was until, you know, I was affected by it. And, you know, that's a really sad thing. And, you know, I'm glad that I know so much now and I've learned so much and I'm in the world. But at the same time, I'm like, why wasn't I taught this in middle school, high school? Why wasn't I taught how to describe my emotions and like know that, hey, me throwing up before a football game was not me being nervous or pregame jitters. It was anxiety based. Me not sleeping much in college because I was so worried about what was next or if I was going to get a job like my classmates at Stanford, like that was anxiety. That wasn't just me being like nervous or scared. Like I had, like, I was going, like I was going through some mental health illnesses and um, you know, and especially like you said about, about like my uh, communities, I mean, minorities just were like uh, the ancestor part where our answers were, were through so much worse. Like we're expected to push on like, no, we're, we're facing trauma from that now. We're fate, like we're going through anxiety and from depression from that right now, and like we are reaping the like all the effects and from it now. And so, what we need help more than ever. So it's why I appreciate every athlete that I see speak out, especially minority based, makes me so happy. It touches me emotionally. Like I saw that Prescott came out uh, today yesterday did his did a thing with uh, Sage Steele and just his impact because he's a quarterback of the. Dallas Cowboys, America's team. He's talking about his depression, anxiety, and how we need to talk and like, and that there's help. And like, my message is that, you know, it's okay to not be okay. Like there's help out there. There's resources, there's medicine, there's therapy, there's meditation. So it's so important because the stigma is so big. And it's the biggest thing that I feel like I've gone through in my life. It took me a year to get almost a year, like eight months to get help after my sister died by suicide because of the stigma. I was afraid people were going to look at me as weak. I was afraid, you know, it's just, I'm sorry, I could talk about this all day because it's so, like, the stigma is really what drives me today to do what we're doing. And I just appreciate you all, you all so much. And um, so, so moving on, um, today we're talking about mental, mental health and perspectives on stigma in underserved communities. We have Dr. Kofi Draza, Ko, um, Draza, Associate Professor at Duke University School of Medicine, and Dr. Jenny, Jenny Wang, founder of Asians for Mental Health Community. Viewers, don't forget, if you have questions, comments, or thoughts throughout throughout the program, please feel free to post at any time. And if you know anyone who can benefit you know, from what we're talking about, the information provided, please share this, this with them. It's, it's so important for people to hear this, to learn about it, and understand more about mental health. Um, so back to you, Kof. Um, what can be done to make mental health care more equitable and accessible for all people? So here, here's where I think um, it's a term that we use, which is workforce. So it, it turns out this is the case across much of medicine. If you have a doctor or a therapist with shared experiences, you actually tend to have better outcomes. So I think one of the things that medicine is really focusing on working on is making sure that our providers look much more like uh, the population of our country. This hasn't always been the case, and I think this is critically important. The, the second thing I'll say, and this is regards uh, to stigma, I think, you know, mental illness is one of those areas of medicine where we tend to know least science is left behind compared to other areas of medicine. So stigma is, has been there throughout, you know, whether it was COVID or before that HIV AIDS or, you know, decades ago cancer. And as we learn more about the science, the stigma tends to go away. So it's, it's one of the reasons why I work so hard in understanding understanding the brain um, and helping people to understand that emotions are actually connected to an organ in your head. And you can get treatment for that organ in the same way you can get treatment if you're having a stomach ache or 
<laughs> or your knees hurting or your, your back is hurting, right? And so I, I really like to help people understand more broadly that um, how this organ works and how it behaves and that, you know, emotions are normal processes in this organ and that we can do things when we're having challenges with our emotions. And, and, and I'll say in, in doing that, I think it's also important that, again, we have ambassadors sharing those same messages, which look like the communities that we're trying to reach. Oh, man, I, I, love, I love what you're saying about the brain being an organ, because it's so true. And, and people understand that. People understand that, you know, that, you know, it can be the, the brain. The brain is a muscle just like anything else in the body. Right? And it can be it can be treated. It can be worked. Um, you know, I deal with that with concussions in football. And like when people come out, say you can't do anything for it. Like you just it's over. Like you get a concussion, you know, your brain's damaged forever. I'm like, no, that's not true. Like my brain is a muscle. It can it can be rehabbed. It can be worked. So, I mean, just just like because of. I mean, I'm just in that world. So, and when people say like, hey, push through, get through it, like about mental health stuff, it's like, like, no, you don't understand it's scientific. Like my, there's something going on. Like I have an imbalance. Like I can't, I can't just get through this. Like this is a disease just like anything else. Like, so that's why I love, and I wish I could just take it, tweet that out and have everyone hear it. So I, I appreciate you. Thank you, man. Um, uh, Dr. Jenny, um, you give corporate workshops on leadership and racial identity. How do you advise companies um, about what they can do better uh, to understand and support mental health needs for diverse communities. I think this really, when we're talking about kind of racial identity and really understanding diverse communities, we have to go back to this idea of psychological safety, right? That if you feel psychologically safe in the workplace, then you are much more likely to feel connected to your coworkers even if they're different from you, right? You are much more likely to share about, hey, my daughter is struggling right now. She just got diagnosed with cancer. Or, hey, my mom is struggling, you know, and she is having a hard time with her, you know, medical treatments or her mental health. When people have a foundation of safety, then connections start being built. With kind of pandemic, with all of this racial justice kind of, you know, situation in our country, a lot of people have shared with me, you know, I had well-intentioned coworkers trying to reach out and say, hey, are you okay? I heard what was happening in the Black and Brown community. I heard what was happening in the Asian American community. And the problem is that there was not really a relationship pre-existing that check-in, right? So then it feels like, wait a second, we haven't even really had a real conversation before. And now you're asking me to bear my soul about how traumatic this is, right? And so I really encourage workplaces, if you are a leader, if you're a team member, when you enter a workspace, are you adding to the psychological safety of that environment or are you taking away from it? Because I believe that it starts there and that's how connections get formed such that we can actually build communities in which people feel included versus just being tokenized, right? And people can feel as though they have a say, they can contribute, they can even challenge the status quo. But without psychological safety, none of that can happen, especially within individuals of color. Uh, yeah, I, 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 I want to dovetail that. I, I just think it's what, what Jenny just said is so critically important. So shared empathy builds community resilience. And so I think it's really important to lay down those roots and build shared empathy because undoubtedly the stresses are going to come in the environment. And that's when you can draw upon that empathy almost as like preventative measure um, when those stressors come down low. Couldn't agree more. You know, um, in like on a football team, we would kind of call that, you know, um, you know, making sure you do the prehab, not just the rehab, you know, to make sure like, hey, like, we have this foundation, like we can, like, I, you, I know you're here for me. I know I can trust you. We have the safe place, but I don't have that when you're just coming after the fact, especially when things like this have been going on for our whole lives. And now you're just now noticing it because, you know, what viral on social media and, you know, which is great you're noticing now, but still I don't have that trust. And so I love just vulnerability. You know, I know vulnerability is hard. It's not easy. It's, it takes a lot, you know, it makes you susceptible to a lot of things, but what I've learned from a lot of people is that, you know, everyone's going through something you don't know about. 
So when you are, have the empathy, when you have that vulnerability and you can talk about these things, like, like I'll tell someone like, Hey, like, you know, I'm struggling. Like I lost my sister. And then they'll tell me something that they lost, you know, their mom and dad, and we can bond over that. And it creates. And so I just love that, like in the workplace and something I'm trying to change in the sports world. Um, Cause like in sports, like it's still looked at as weak. Like guys are like, I have to be this warrior all the time. I have to be on, on, on. Like I'm trying to let people know that, you know, it's okay to not be okay. And it's okay to get help because when what I'm trying to teach guys about like the brain, but what, what I know, what I know about the brain is that like when your mind is free, your body's going to move better. You're going to be more powerful and everything. So, and I'm trying to teach like coaches and owners as well that like, Hey, if we have an environment that is like, like psychologically free and safe, like we'll have a better team. We'll have more unity. We'll have more foundation. We'll be able to build more and more and more, um, you know, and just have like our guys with more free minds, more, you know, so that's, I, I totally, I, I really do. I really do love that. And, and I think that was really powerful. So then I, I'll, I'll go even further. You know, you said you, when your mind is free, your body's going to move better. I look, when your mind is free, your mind is going to move better. Right. I, I think we take for granted that your brain uses energy, right? So whether you want it to or not, that anxiety is using up energy that is then taking away resources to do other things, right? Whether it's concentrate or connect with other people or sleep or do other things that are really important for improving our, our function. So yeah, I mean, when your mind is free, your mind is <laughs> your mind is more free. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I, yeah, I, I, need, I need to bring you to talk to these owners. <laughs> um, all right. So Coffin Jenny, this is for both of you. Um, uh, for everyone to benefit, stigma reduction is necessary too. How can we better tackle uh, stigma within minority communities and help people feel empowered to openly discuss mental and emotional health? Um, I can go first. I, I think the one thing that we can really encourage is that, you know, when we are able to even just vocalize our struggles with one safe person, right? It creates that ability to be received in a person's presence and not judged. That is extremely powerful, right? And I think it teaches people that vulnerability will not be met with criticism, judgment, right? And so I always encourage people to think about how can you right, be vulnerable with one person, right? And how that has a cascade effect on that person and then the individuals who follow, right? Um, and so I think that, you know, in terms of stigma, I wish it was like a, let's snap our fingers, we get over the stigma, but that's not how it's going to work, right? It has to be a multiplicative effect in which there are leaders perhaps who have done the internal work, who have fought through the fears of being vulnerable, who then offer that as a gift of vulnerability for the people they have influence over. And then those people then continue to share that vulnerability going forward. And I always say we can give other people the gift of going second when we go first, right? And so I think that's where it starts is start where you are, start where you have your reach in the spheres of influence that you have and be able to step into a little bit of the discomfort that vulnerability triggers in all of us, knowing that that is the pathway to real connection. Amazing. Yeah, we talk about this in, in science and in medicine a lot. And it's this idea that if you can't see it, you can't be it, right? And so how important it is for people to see pictures of themselves in, in others and reflections of themselves. And particularly, you know, when it comes to how we as human beings interact, we are a social species. And so we are built to take cues from other people that we respect and look up to. So I, I, again, I mean, I, I will <laughs> simply echo what Jenny is saying. It's just important for people, the young folks and community to see people that they look up to modeling the behavior, right? It's, it's just going to be so critically important. Um, 
if you're young and you want to be a scientist, you need to see a scientist modeling the behavior of being emotionally healthy. If you're young and you want to be a doctor, you need to see a doctor. If you're young and you want to play football, you need to see a football player or a basketball player or a nurse or, you know, a leader or a senator or a congressman. And so I think it's really important for uh, people to demonstrate what it looks like to be emotionally healthy, as well as, you know, getting the preventative emotional care um, and, and driving towards well-being. And, you know, there's no, uh, I'd say there's no time in our history where this is, is, is going to be so important. We're all, we all know that um, mental health challenges follow trauma. And if you think about where we as a human species are, we have not experienced a global trauma of this magnitude for decades upon decades, maybe a century. And so we know that after this trauma, mental health challenges will certainly arise, whether it's the young kid that has been disconnected from their friends for a year or the parent trying to figure out how to take care of that young kid and be a teacher, the trauma will certainly follow. And so there's no more critical time than now for people to see really good, healthy examples of those who are driving towards mental well-being. Um, so we're here at our lightning round. So it's our it's our final questions. And I will ask five rapid fire questions. Um, we'll go one person each, quick answers, or if you want to elaborate, you can. Um, you know, I, I'm loving just hearing from y'all. Um, honestly, it's been great for me. Um, and you know, we're gonna start with Jenny, and then we'll circle around you, cough. Um, all right, you ready, Jenny? Yes. All right. So first question is, uh, what helps you cope when you're going through a tough time mentally? Running and therapy. Love it. Love it. Um, <laughs> When you're feeling down, uh, what song or type of music do you turn to? Eye of the Tiger or podcast. <laughs> Love that. Eye of the Tiger, yeah. <laughs> That's awesome. That's awesome. Um, what gives you the most stress relief? Um, is it a person, dog, animal, or it could be whatever? My kids. Oh, <laughs> so sweet. Uh, um, we've all just gone through one of the hardest years in recent history. Um, what surprised you the most, good or bad? The resiliency of people, even in the midst of their pain. That has surprised me remarkably. Yeah, um, so true. Um, and then last question, kind of, what gives you hope? That people are seeing the world perhaps differently after this last year and realizing perhaps what's most important and what they really want to lean into going forward. Definitely really kind of brought us back into our values and what really matters in life. You know, you know, I, I, I hope, hopefully that's one of the positives from the pandemic. If there, um, all right, cough, we got you up. You ready? All right, let's do it. I sure. What helps you cope when you're going through a tough time mentally? Uh, I love watching mixed martial arts. <laughs> oh, I all right. You're a UFC fan? I, I'm a super UFC fan. I, it's the idea that two people go in and they compete. And then at the end, you know, each person might be a little bit slightly injured or touched, but life goes on, right? And you continue to improve and train to get better. So Those athletes are unbelievable. The training they do, the mental work that they have to do is unreal. All right. Second question. When you're feeling down, what song or type of music do you turn to? Always uh, Kanye and Two Chains. <laughs> hey, let's go, <laughs> my guy. Um, yeah, I, it's I, I love. I'm different. That's that's my song right there. <laughs> I love, love it. I'm different. Yeah. I'm different. <laughs> let's go. Okay. What gives you most the most stress relief? Is it a, a person, a dog, or or whatever? Uh, my loved ones. Um, and if you can combine bind my loved ones with the beach that. Nothing's better than putting your feet in the sand. Love that. All right. <clears throat> We've all been through one of the hardest years in recent history. What surprised you the most, good or bad? Uh, in, a, in a good way, right? I mean, even, even this forum here, right? I mean, you would almost forget that two years ago, we didn't connect 
in Zoom all of the time, right? Um, but for me, it was, you know, Sunday afternoons connecting with my family out of town. I, I saw my family in a lot of ways and had space for them in ways that I haven't, you know, in the last 10 to 15 years of working in the lab and, and being in medical school. So that for me has been just an incredible, pleasant surprise in the way we created more space for each other. No, I love that. It really brought back the power of just connections with our loved ones and, and humans and really just really value that a lot. And, all right. Last question. What gives you hope? Uh, spaces like this give me hope, right? Where you can bring in folks of different experiences, different backgrounds, but there's a common and a clear purpose. So again, thank you for having me here. And um, I've been incredibly inspired sharing time and space with you all. Thank you, Kauf, and thank you, thank you, uh, thank you both so much. And I'll just tell you what gives me hope is, is like, like you said, Kauf, like these kind of conversations, hearing from you and, and Jenny, you know, it's, it's inspiring to me because I've, I've become an advocate for like two years now, you know, just because of my situation, what my family went through and just the pain, you know, we deal with and how it made me see like the world and that what meant the mental health world and how far behind we are and how much work we have to do. And just the work you guys are doing in the real work, like in the fields, like working with clients, doing all the science work with the brain, like you're truly changing the world and, and saving lives. So I hope you know every day that your, your life is just so meaningful and so impactful to so many people. So just thank you both. And um, now we'll hear from our team at One Mind Cyber Guide about a science-based app that aims to help happify your life. Hi, my name is Martha Neary, and I'm the project manager of One Mind Cyber Guide. At One Mind Cyber Guide, we provide advice and guidelines to people who are interested in using mental health apps. Mental health apps can be a great tool to add to your mental health toolkit. Research has shown that apps are especially helpful when used as an add-on to traditional treatment with a licensed provider. In one study, which looked at apps to help reduce depression and anxiety through skills building exercises, Participants saw benefits from using the app for just under a minute and a half each time. This suggests that even using an app for a couple of minutes each day might be helpful for you. Most good habits can take a little while to form. Building the use of an app into the daily routine that you already have may help you use it in a more sustained way. For example, maybe you brush your teeth and then use the app or use it after dinner. Most apps also allow you to set notifications, which can be really helpful to remind you to use the app regularly. Happify aims to help users reduce stress, anxiety, and negative thinking and improve emotional well-being. Based on the user's goals, the app suggests different tracks for the user. Tracks are based on cognitive behavioral therapy, or CBT, mindfulness, positive psychology, and other evidence-based practices. Tracks contain groups of activities and games which can help the user achieve their goals. Examples of tracks include managing stress in uncertain times and stop the worry cycle. Users can also participate in the Happify community through forums and public posts, and they can read a digest of positive news through Happify daily. You can read our review of Happify on the One Mind Cyber Guide app guide. The app score is 5 out of 5 on credibility, 4.59 out of 5 on user experience, and has an acceptable transparency score. You can also read the professional review of Happify, where we outline some pros and cons of the app and make some recommendations for use. We look forward to seeing you next week for another app review. Thanks, CyberGuide team. Thank you to Dr. Jenny Wang and Dr. Kofi Jarasa. The viewers, thank you too. Don't forget you can post questions and check out all of our Brainwave episodes at onemind.org slash brainwaves. You're feeling anxious, afraid, alone. I haven't been able to see my family or my friends. Families that struggled to find mental health care before find it even harder now. I feel a lot of guilt in not being with my family. Are there solutions? Visit onemind.org, seeking the answers, bringing help to the front lines, accelerating brain health for all. Help us fund new treatments at onemind.org.